Good evening, Oak Ridge, and welcome to our seventh class on the book of Revelation. We're entering chapter four tonight, and it's a, it's a chapter that's dedicated to John entering into the throne room of heaven. Now, before we get into all of the imagery and the ideas, ideas that John is presented with, we want to dig deeper into where this imagery is coming from. And the truth of the matter is there's been two other calls of prophets, at least, in the Old Testament that where, where prophets entered the throne rooms that John is drawing imagery out of. These are in Isaiah 6 and Ezekiel chapter 1. We want to spend some time looking at that and thinking about what we're actually seeing and what's supposed to be picked up from the idea of God calling these prophets and sending them with a message to his people. Now, John has already delivered these little individual messages to each of the churches, challenging them to remain in the covenantal relationship with God and remain faithful to God. But this is going into a whole letter of prophecy, and John is being called as a prophet and being tasked with the opportunity to go to the people with a message from God. What I want you to watch for in all of these um, images, in all of these stories that we're pulling together, is these three ideas. Is there a throne? And it, it, is it unlike human thrones? In, in what ways is it similar? In what ways is it different? And there are strange creatures involved. They're unnatural creatures. They're creatures you don't see in everyday life. And what does that mean? And notice that there is a sending of the prophet to God's people. Now, yes, John has already said in the letter that he received special messages for each church, but he's also delivering one big message. And we want to pay attention to what that is because we learned some of it from here in the throne room. But we're going to begin in Isaiah chapter 6. Now, this is before... This is before Israel has gone into captivity. And Isaiah is speaking to the people on behalf of God, letting them know that this punishment is coming. And there are empires coming to overtake the people of God. And because the people of God have refused to repent or respond to God, then this judgment's coming. But before it comes, Isaiah receives this call. In the year of King Uzziah's death, so King Uzziah was a late uh, king ruling over the northern kingdom, I saw the sovereign master seated on high, elevated on a high elevated throne. The hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs stood over him. Each one had six wings with two wings. They covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two, the remaining two, they fly. They called out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord who commands armies. His majestic splendor fills the entire earth. The sound of their voices shook the door frames, and the temple was filled with smoke. Now you see, Isaiah is in the temple. And he's in the temple and he receives this vision of God's throne. And he's seated high up and exalted, way up. And notice that it says there are seraphs that stood over him. And so as he's on the throne, the only thing that Isaiah can see of God is is the hem of his robe filling the temple. Not his robe, but the hem of his robe filling the temple. But above the hem of his robe, above all of that, he can see seraphs flying around above the throne. Now, what are seraphs? Well, literally, the Hebrew word refers to something that's on fire, a burning one, a, a creature that's burning, flaming creature. But elsewhere in the Bible, seraphs refer to serpents or snakes. Snakes that when they bite you, leave a burning sensation. And we know from, other, from archaeology and from other neighboring cultures that seraphs are often depicted with royal um, persons as protectors and guardians and that they are in fact winged snakes, snakes that fly. 
These are unnatural creatures that speak of something supernatural. These seraphs. Isaiah sees them. And he sees this throne. And he sees it above the temple. And the hem of God's robe covers the, the entire temple. And then uh, the, the passage says... Um, Isaiah said, Too bad for me, I'm destroyed, for my lips are contaminated by sin, and I live among people whose lips are contaminated by sin. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord who commands armies. But then one of the seraphs, now just picture this, this flying, flaming snake flew toward me. His hand was, in his hand was a hot coal he had taken from the altar with tongs, he touched my mouth with it and said, Look, this coal has touched your lips. Your evil is removed. Your sin is forgiven. I heard the voice of the sovereign master say, Whom will I send? Who will go on our behalf? And I answered, Here I am. Send me. He said, Go and tell these people. And then he gives Isaiah the message. Now, this is a scary picture if you'll get into it. If you'll let yourself drop down into the imagination Isaiah is presenting here. And you'll begin to picture this flaming, flying snake with hands and tongs in his hand and a burning coal from the, from the altar, this glowing red coal. And he comes and he, and he hits your lips with it. And just imagine the smell of your, your own skin burning. But instantly there's an announcement. Who will we send and... Isaiah responds, send me. So the burning has not wounded him, but has cleansed him. And then he goes, a sinful man made clean, to the unclean people to deliver a message. Now that's Isaiah, and you need to read the rest of Isaiah. I just want you to see this call of Isaiah in this throne room situation. And then we'll go over to Ezekiel chapter 1. Now Ezekiel is after Israel has fallen. It's after Judah has fallen. It is set where Ezekiel is sitting by a river in Babylon and he is mourning the exile and the enslavement and the oppression of his people who are living away from their homeland in exile in another country. And as he is sitting by the river, he sees this vision. As I watched, I noticed a windstorm coming from the north. An enormous cloud with lightning flashing with such bright light rimmed it, and it came and, and came from it like a glowing amber from the middle of the fire. In the fire were what looked like four living beings. So 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 hold on. So here's Ezekiel, and he sees a cloud that has fire. Where have we heard that before? That's an Exodus illusion. God led his people out of the wilderness and out of exile in Egypt into the promised land in a cloud that was, was dark on one side and fiery on the other. And here comes a great cloud towards Ezekiel, who's already sitting in exile. This is already imagery that God hasn't forgotten us in exile. Are you catching this church? And so here he goes. He, he sees this vision. He sees this, this cloud and this fire and this amber glow around the cloud. And he sees in the fire that were what looked like four living beings. In their appearance, they had human form, but each had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, but the soles of their feet were like calves' feet. They gleamed like polished bronze. They had human hands under their wings on their four sides. As for the what, four sides, hold on. Are you trying to picture this? So put this together. Just think. They got uh, appearance like a human form. They have four faces. They have four wings. They have straight legs, but they have calves' feet for feet. They gleam like polished bronze. They had human hands under their wings. As for their faces and the, four, the wings of the four of them, their wings touched each other, and they did not turn as they moved, but went straight ahead. Now, I, see, I'm already confused because I can see how if they're back to back and their wings are touching, 
One is facing east and one is facing west and one is facing north and one is facing south. And they move, uh, as they move, they move straight ahead. But if they all move straight ahead, they're moving away from each other. But their wings are touching. So how is this happening? Their faces had this appearance. Each of the four had the face of a man with the face of a lion on the right, the face of an ox on the left, and also the face of an eagle. Their wings were spread out. Above them, each had two wings touching the wings of one of the other beings on the either side and two wings covering their bodies. Each moved straight ahead, whether the spirit would go, they would go without turning as they went. Now, how did they do that? How did they do that? In the middle of the living beings was something like burning coals of fire. Wait a second, we've seen that before in Isaiah. Or like torches, it moved back and forth among the living beings. It was bright and lightning was flashing out of the fire. And the living beings moved backward and forward as quickly as flashes of lightning. This thing is bouncing around like a pinball in a pinball machine. Then I looked and I saw one wheel on the ground beside each of the four beings. So next to them, I don't know, are they riding unicycles or is the wheel just beside them or is it right below them? We're not really sure. The appearance of the wheels and their construction was like gleaming jasper. That's a greenish colored gem, semi-precious gemstone. And all four wheels looked alike. Their structure was like a wheel within a wheel. What is that? Does that mean a hub inside the wheel or is it more like a gyroscope where one wheel turns one way and the other wheel turns another way? I don't understand. When they moved, they would go in any of the four directions they faced without turning as they moved. The rims were high and awesome, and the rims of all four wheels were full of eyes all around. Eyes, eyeballs. They had eyeballs all over the wheels. When the living beings moved, the wheels moved beside them moved. And when the living beings rose up from the ground, the wheels rose up too. And wherever the spirit would go, they would go. And the wheels would rise up beside them because the spirit of the living being was inside the wheel. The wheel had a wheel inside the wheel, but it also had a spirit inside the wheel. When the living beings moved, the wheels moved. And when they stopped moving, the wheels stopped. And when they rose from the ground, the wheels rose up. And when the wheels rose up beside them, the spirit of the living being was in the wheel. Sorry, I read that twice. Over the heads of the living beings was something like a platform, glittering awesomely like ice, stretched out over their heads. There is a great dome above them made out of ice. Under the platform, their wings were stretched out, each toward the other. Each of the beings also had two wings covering its body. When they moved, I heard the sound of their wings. It was like the rushing of waters or the voice of the Almighty or the tumult of an army. And when they stood still, they lowered their wings. Then there was a voice from above the platform over their heads where they, when they stood still above the platform over their heads was something like a sapphire shaped, like a throne. High above on the throne was a form that appeared to be a man. I saw an amber glow like a fire enclosed all around from his waist above. From his waist down, I saw something that looked like fire. There was a brilliant light around it, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds after the rain. This was the appearance of the surrounding brilliant light. It looked like the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I threw myself face down and I heard a voice saying, He said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak to you. And as he spoke to me, a wind came into me and stood me on my feet. And I heard the one speaking. He said to me, son of man, I am sending you to the house of Israel, to the rebellious nations who have rebelled against me. Both they and their fathers have revolted against me to this very day. This is crazy imagery. Now, before we read Revelation, here's here's what I want to talk about. Uh, one of my favorite um, sources of theology and understanding scriptures is actually the old books, the Chronicles of Narnia. (laughs) And in this book, the fourth book, The Silver Chair, and that's the fourth book as it's supposed to be. If you have a set that doesn't have the silver chair as the fourth book, it's because they rearranged them and that's not good. You need to get them in the right order. Anyway, in The Silver Chair, these children have come from our world and gone into Narnia. And they have discovered a prince of Narnia, Prince Rulian, 
has been captured by an evil queen and being held underground as a prisoner. And they go in and they find him and he's under an enchantment, trapped in a silver chair that has an enchantment that's keeping him enslaved to this witch. And so they destroy the chair and they free him and then this witch comes in. She takes some green powder out of a box, and a wooden box, and puts it on the fire in the fireplace. Now keep in mind they're underground. She puts the wooden fire, the, the, the powder on the fire in the fireplace, and this smell begins to permeate the room, and it puts them all under a spell. And they begin to contest to her that they are children who have come from the world above, not not the underground world, but the world above ground, and that they have come to rescue Prince Rillian. And, and she wants to know about this land that they've made up because there is no other world than the underground world. And she contests this as she casts this spell on them. And she begins to argue with them. And they try to talk about the sun. And she says, tell me about the sun. And they describe the lamp sitting or hanging from the ceiling in this room is like the sun, only the sun's much bigger and much brighter and it gives light to the whole land. And she says, that's very interesting. And then Lucy remembers Aslan, the lion, and talks about Aslan. And she says, the, you know, Aslan is this great lion. And she says, what's a lion? And she says, well, have you ever seen a cat? And yes, I have. Well, he's very much like a cat, except he's much bigger. And then the witch begins to say, you see, you see, you, you make up these fancy ideas about a sun, but it's really just a lamp that you're imagining is bigger. And you think of a cat, but you want something greater. So you think, imagine a lion, but these things are all in your imagination. They're not real. And she begins to contest everything that they try to explain, that they try to remember from the world above. They just, they can't quite hold on to because she twists everything to tell them they're just make-believe. There is no great lion Aslan, and there is no great thing called a sun. There are only lamps, and there is only the underground world. Now, I'd love to tell you how that works out for them, but you need to go read the book if you haven't read it. And if you have read it, you already know. Suffice it to say that some burnt marsh wiggles involved. But here's how it fits with our study in Revelation. Why are we talking about flying, flaming snakes? Why are we talking about beasts with faces of different animals and wings and wheels that are covered with eyeballs and emeralds that are glowing and flames of fire? Why are we using all of this imagery? Where is this imagery coming from and why does it exist? Well, we know that for Revelation, some of this imagery is coming out of Isaiah and Ezekiel. What I want to take you to now is the book of Revelation, and, and I just want to read for you chapter 4. After these things I looked, and there was a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice I had heard speaking to me, like a trumpet, said, Come up here so that I can show you what must happen after these things. So John's on the island of Patmos. He's been for a walk on the beach. He's heard this voice. This voice has shown him candlesticks lampstands, and one like a son of man walking among them. And he's had this in their interaction and seen the glory of the son of man. And now he's being invited up into heaven to see what's about to happen. Immediately, I was in the spirit and, and a throne was standing in heaven with someone seated on it. And the one seated on it was like Jasper, the green stone, and Carnelian, a red stone, in appearance. And a, the, and a rainbow looking like it was made of emerald, so clear and shining, crystalline, encircled the throne. In a circle around the throne were 24 other thrones. So we have these little thrones around this great throne. And seated on those thrones were 24 elders, and they were dressed in white clothing and had golden crowns on their head. Now, you want to remember that. We're not going to talk about it tonight, but it'll come back up. 
From the throne came flashes of lightning and roaring and crashes of thunder, seven flaming torches, which are the seven spirits of God, were burning in front of the throne, and in front of the throne was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. In the middle of the throne and all around the throne were four living creatures, uh uh-oh, full of eyes in front and back. Now the eyes are on the creatures. The first living creature was like a lion, uh uh-oh, the second like an ox, the third had the face like a man's, and the fourth like a flying eagle. Each one of the four living creatures had six wings and was full of eyes all around and inside. They never rest day or night saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the all-powerful, who was and who is and who is still to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to the one who sits on the throne who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders throw themselves to the ground before the one who sits on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. And they offer their crowns. They offer their crowns before his throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power since you created all things. And because of your will, they existed and were created. And what I want you to take home tonight from this thought And then Cap and I are going to sit down and talk about this together. What I want you to take home is this idea that the elders have given us a clue when they took their thrones off. And all of this strange imagery has given us a clue about the throne on which God sits. You see, here's what's about to happen. This entire book is about to address the fake assumed, arrogant, conceited power of the emperor in Rome. And it is about to say that his throne is no real throne and that his power and his authority is no real power and authority. And that God in his throne room is in fact truly God because he's the creator God. And that this God is not like any human ruler. This God is not a God, is not a ruler, is not an authority that is oppressive to people. This God is not a God that is self-serving. This God is not a God that created us simply as as subservants to him. But rather, this is a God that seeks fellowship even with 24 elders. But they know their place and they take off their crowns and throw them before him. You see, it is recognized that he's the only one to justly possess authority because he's the only one who is purely good. And to all other authority, whether it be the 24 elders who wear white robes and have been given golden crowns, or it be the emperor sitting on a throne in Rome, these authorities can only exercise authority well if they do it according to God's nature and God's call. And so all of this imagery is to say to us that God is nothing like us and that he is in fact nothing The kingdom of heaven is nothing like the emperor, nothing like Rome. We are entering into a kingdom and we are participating in a kingdom that is is completely different. Okay, we're going to transition from here into a conversation between Cap and I. Thanks for being here, Oak Ridge. Okay, Cap and I are settled in the One Way Cafe and what I'm going to do is just open this up for him to ask a couple of questions. And then I, and I want to say a couple of things. In fact, let me say one thing that I didn't say in the earlier video. So it's, I, I accidentally kind of said um, throne room, throne room. And, and what we want to catch is that for Isaiah, he's in the temple. And the throne is above the temple. 
And for Ezekiel, he's sitting by the river Kibar in Babylon, and the throne is coming to him. But in both cases, the throne's in heaven, you know. And so John, walking on the beach on Patmos Island, gets caught up by the Holy Spirit and taken up to heaven. This, that's why I'm calling it the throne room. It's wherever God's throne is, is the throne room, right? And it's not that there's one particular throne room. Although John's uh, um, description looks a whole lot like the temple. Well, he has the sea out in front of it, and, and at the temple there's a big, um, what they call the sea, uh, in front of the temple where they would they would wash, do proper uh, special washings, <coughs> ceremonial washings for the priests. And so that sea is out in front of the temple, and so the, John's description sounds like the temple too. Um, but either way, the temple represents the place where God sits. So this is about God's authority. And that's, that's really what this whole chapter is about, is recognizing God is in charge. And God is in charge because God is the creator. And he's other than us and he's bigger than us. He's not just a bigger version of us, but he's completely different from us, more powerful, He's things we cannot comprehend. God is beyond our comprehension, and we're forced to use language, our own language and our own images, to describe Him. But even as we use all these strange creatures and these pictures of gemstones and all of these images in Revelation, I just want to lay this foundation that that's about trying to use limited human vocabulary to describe things that are really beyond us to understand. Okay. So what, other ideas that pop in your head. One of the questions that came up with is in the, it says somewhere that uh, we're created in God's image. Yeah. And yet what you described has nothing to do with what we look like. Exactly. Exactly. It's a great question. So the image of God language comes out of Genesis 1, and that's where um, the the, te- the Hebrew text actually uses the word that's going to later get used as idol, right? Um, and and if you look, read the Greek Old Testament, the Greek version of the Old Testament, the word li- there literally is icon. So we're the icons of God. So the way that people create idols to be a representation of the God on earth God has said, I have made you my representatives on earth. And it's not so much about what we look like, that we look like God, but it's about that we are representatives carrying his authority. And that's an important thing because in the, in the video earlier, I'm talking about the emperor in Rome not having authority. Yes, he does have authority. He actually has authority. But its authority has become illegitimate because he's enacting that authority as though he is God when he's not, and he is acting in ways that are out of the character of the Creator God. And so that authority becomes illegitimate. And so it's really important for us to understand that Revelation is about calling Christians to live their citizenship in the kingdom of heaven and not in cooperation with the empire though in submission to the empire. I mean, not in rebellion against the empire, no. But, all, but, but not in cooperation with the empire when the empire is doing wicked, evil things. So, yeah. All right. And the other thing was uh, the issue with, or the comment was, uh, son of man. Son of man. And that, you know, because I always look at, Son of Man is really a change that's changed to Son of God, or you know. But Jesus was called Son of Man for a long time, right? So, yes, Jesus is in fact is the one who calls himself Son of Man, and he really likes that term. Um, and he takes it not out of Ezekiel, but out of Daniel. And there's this reference in Daniel seven to one like a Son of Man ascending on the clouds to sit on the throne with God which ties it into this whole throne stuff. And so you're absolutely right. I mean, Jesus is referred to as Son of Man in those messages in chapter 2 and 3. Um, but Ezekiel, in the, in the reading that I did, God calls Ezekiel Son of Man. 
And so for both Jesus and for Ezekiel, what that statement is, that or that um, nickname, if you will, is son of man, meaning you're a human. So it, it's fun in the book of Ezekiel. It's like it, God saying, hey, human. Instead of saying, hey, Ezekiel, he says, hey, human, come over here. I want to show you something. Hey, human, uh, I've got words I want you to speak to the people. Hey, human, um, I'm going to show you this valley of dry bones, and we're going to talk about this valley of dry bones. And Jesus takes that term with humility. I'm a son of man. And he comes and lives among us as a son of man. And again, this is the exact opposite way that here the son of God is choosing to act as son of man because he's letting go of his position and his privilege and his power in order to create solidarity with us, connection with us. And that's not how the emperor lives. That's not how the king of Babylon lived. That's not how the king of Assyria lived. Right, right. right? That's not how human kings exercise their authority. The creator God became flesh and dwelt among us. And so this, this, this whole image of God on his throne, it's to, it's, it's to create for us not another imp- image of saying God is the true emperor and, the, and Caesar's the false emperor. It's to say God is the true God. And there is no other God. There is no one like our God. And our loyalty is to him first. So that's really powerful. That's a a very important... You picking up on the phrase son of man or the nickname son of man, that's a a good catch. It's good for what we're talking about. Okay. Um, It seems distressing, Mm -hmm. a better word. But that the, defin- the description of God on the throne is so uh, upsetting. Mm-hmm. You know, all the colors and the fire and the snakes and everything that we see as evil. When I was listening to the presentation, that's what I thought, that this was related to an evil being mm-hmm. much more than what God was. Mm. Ooh, that's a great, that's a great image. Um and the, and the reality is, I, I don't want to fix that for you. I don't want, because I think, and this is, this is true for, I think it's worth us stopping and thinking about, Oak Ridge. Um, this image does cause Isaiah to cry out, I, I, I'm a sinner, I shouldn't be here. This is a dangerous place for me to be. As the four living creatures, or the snakes flying fiery snakes cry out holy 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 what they that word holy means one of a kind means unique means there is nothing else like this you know even when we talk about um, the holy and the profane in in typical language or the sacred and the profane we're talking about okay stuff in the church that's special you should you should be careful around it but you know, there's other things that are not, or, or in the temple, there's certain vessels, or certain candlesticks, or certain um, lotions, even the anointing oils that are holy. You're not allowed to use the anointing oil that you use to anoint a priest on on other people, oh, yeah. that because it's holy, <clears throat> and that means it's unique, it's special, it's reserved for something se- separate. And so, so yes, Isaiah feels fear. And the possibility that he will be he will be obliterated because he's unholy, and God is holy. Um, Ezekiel is is frightened by the image, and he falls down dead, <laughs> as though he's dead. And then this wind, the spirit, moves, and it says it's such a cool image. I love to imagine it in my head. It goes into his lungs and animates him, and, re- and levitates him, and sets him up on his feet. Okay. You know, I mean this. This image, and so yes, it is a frightening image, and it's frightening to John as well. John is afraid um, as he hears as he hears this language and he sees these visions. This is very frightening. It is frightening. And if I can do this, I'm going to do another um, Chronicles of Narnia reference here. In the first book, *Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe*, they're describing uh, the the four children 
are sitting with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver at their dinner table. And Mr. and Mr. Be- Mrs. Beaver are describing Aslan the great lion. Now, in the books, Aslan represents Jesus. I mean, he is a symbol in Narnia. He, he appears in Narnia as a lion, which of course works because Jesus is the Lion of Judah as well in the Bible. Um, but they, they're describing this great lion, and when the lion comes, he'll, he'll take the witch out of power, and the, the eternal winter that they have been living in, this all, always winter, never Christmas, that they've been living in, once Aslan is on the move, then he's going to take her out of power and things are going to go back to normal with normal life. And, and one of the girls, I think it's Lucy, asks the beavers, this Aslan, this lion, is he safe? And Mr. Beaver busts out laughing and says, oh, my dear child, did you not hear what I said? He's a lion. He's the king of the beasts. He is the most ferocious animal in the whole world. There is no more powerful, um, more dangerous being than Aslan. But I tell you, child, he is good. Hmm. And that's the catch. Caesar is plenty dangerous. Rome is plenty dangerous to all the people in the world. But Caesar's not good. Right. And God is infinitely more dangerous <laughs> and more frightening than Caesar. But God is good. And that's, that's the point of Revelation. It's frightening to John. It's frightening to me, us as readers if we'll let the text do what it wants to do in us. It'll frighten us. Yeah. But, um, but what's going to happen all the way through is this reminder that the, the, the danger that is, God represents is danger to evil, not danger to goodness. And um, God is the God who washes us and gives us white robes and brings us home. You know, and God is good. So... Um, you know, we, I want you to, I want you to be frightened. I want that to stay, but at the same time, I think it's important that we understand. But God is good, um, and that's what we're talking about as we enter into the Book of Revelation. So carry this in. See again. This is, this is for for Isaiah, for Ezekiel, and for John. This is all very political. It's about kingdoms in power. It's about the kingdom of Israel losing power to Assyria and Isaiah. It's about the kingdom of Judah having gone into captivity in Babylon and exile in Babylon, and they've lost power, and it looks like the evil kingdom of Babylon's in control. Um, For John, it looks like the evil kingdom of Rome is in control. These kingdoms are in power. Um, but the creator God is in fact greater than all of these empires. And he is bringing the kingdom of heaven. And that's the, where our loyalty lies. That's what the, the book is about. And this is a good setup for us. Oak Ridge, this has been a, a good class. This is fun. I think Cap and I are going to hang, hang on to this format where I do a little teaching at the beginning and then we interact about it. And, um, I pray blessings on you. Cap, you want, you, I'm going to put you on the spot again like I did last time. You want to close us out with a prayer? Sure. Let's close out with a prayer. Dear Lord, bless the, the church and all the members of, of the church and their families and keep us safe and help us put an end to this virus so that we can get back to the life that we so love. Yes, Lord. And, and bless everybody because we've learned now our families are important. Uh, one of the things out of this stay-at-home thing is that we have time for God again. Yes. Across the country, across the world. And if that's, that, that's got to be a very good thing for everyone. Yes. And I pray that everybody stays safe and healthy. And I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Bye now. Bye.